Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Pilgrim's Pulpit, a ministry of Josh Pilgrim, pastor of Riverview Baptist Church in Calhoun, Georgia. Our aim is to produce faithful, maturing disciples of Jesus through passionate, Christ-centered, expositional preaching. As Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. You remain standing and take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Turn to the Gospel of John one more time as we finish this book. Uh, it's almost been two years exactly since we started. And uh, man, time flies when you're having fun. This has just been a good book. But we conclude today from John chapter 21. I'm going to begin in verse 18. John 21, beginning in verse 18, and I'm preaching today on this subject, follow me no matter what. Follow me no matter what. From John chapter 21, we're going to begin in verse 18. Jesus is speaking to Peter, and these are his words. Riverview, this is God's word. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This, Jesus said, to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I want to begin with a question for you to ponder today. It's something I've thought about many times. If someone gave you the option for you to know the exact date and the way in which you were going to die, would you want to know? I see some people saying, yep. And I see some people saying, nope. But what if you did know? What if you knew, whether it be a year from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, what if you did know? Would it change anything about what you're doing today? Would it change how you lived for Jesus? Well, Peter had the fortunate or unfortunate <laughs> blessing, I guess, however you look at it, to know the day or how at least he was going to die. Jesus had just spoken about Peter's life in ministry. Sounds good. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Sounds pretty good, Lord. This is going to be great. There's one more thing, Peter. I don't just want to talk to you about your life. I need to talk to you about your death. 
this had to be a shock to Peter. I mean, they're having this conversation over breakfast, for goodness sake. I mean, there's better times to have this conversation, Jesus. I mean, we just ate. But now the Lord is just discussing openly the fact that one day Peter is going to die a gruesome death. And no, no doubt, Peter in one moment was rejoicing that he had been restored to fellowship and restored back to ministry and back to being an apostle. So why bring up martyrdom now? And it got me to think about something. You guys know this if you've been in listening to this sermon series. All of John's gospel was really aimed at one thing to write these things so that you might, what? Believe, that you might believe in Jesus. That is, that you might become a Christian, that you might read these things, believe that they are true, put your faith in Jesus, and have life in his name. That's what the whole book's about, almost. The first 20 chapters, that's what it's about to believe in Jesus, but not chapter 21. Chapter 21 reminds us that evangelism without discipleship is incomplete. It is not enough for you just to walk out of here saying, I believe, because the Lord Jesus not only tells you believe in me, but the same Lord who says believe in me then says, now follow me. You cannot say that you have believed in Jesus if you refuse to follow Jesus. It's not enough to believe. Life in his name does not come from just believing, but by following. And so the last chapter moves from Peter's faith to Peter following Jesus. And it's a question every one of us in this room has to answer. Are you willing to follow Jesus no matter what? I didn't ask, did you, are, have you believed? And the question is not, have you been baptized? Are you willing to follow him till the day you die? And that's really what we want to deal with today. There's two points to this sermon, and they are very simple. The first point has to do with follow Jesus no matter what happens to you. And the second one is likened to it. Follow Jesus no matter what happens to others. Let's look at verse 28, or chapter 21, verse 18 and 19. Follow Jesus, first of all, no matter what happens to you. The first truth we notice here in this conversation with Peter, and we mentioned this last week, is that there is a cost to discipleship. If you're taking notes, there is a cost to discipleship. And we see the cost in verse 18. Peter is given a personal prophecy. A prophecy, a prediction about his death. Jesus essentially tells Peter, Peter, you will die. He says, Peter, one day you're going to be led by another. You're going to be dressed by another. You're going to be carried by another. You're going to be crucified against your will. While you were young, you got to go wherever you wanted. But when you are old, someone else will take you where you do not want to go. Now, we might think that that just destroys Peter but in some way, I think that might have given him some assurance. You said, that doesn't sound very encouraging. How, how could that give assurance? Think about this. Just a few weeks before, in the crucial moment when Peter had the chance to confess Jesus, he denied Jesus three times to save himself from a cross. Peter was trying to get away from the cross. And now Jesus gives him assurance. Peter, you will face the cross again. And this time, Peter, you will embrace it. You will gladly go to that cross. You will die a martyr's death for me. And your death will bring me great glory. The, the Peter who, who thought he would die in faithlessness is promised that he's going to die in faithfulness. Peter, you will not finally 
fall away. Isn't that good news for Peter? I mean, just a few minutes ago, he thought he was done. He thought, I've denied the Lord. I avoided the cross. And Jesus says, Peter, you will follow me and you will not miss the cross. No, you're, you are marching to the cross. There is a cost, Peter, to discipleship. One of the early church fathers was a guy named Ignatius of Antioch. Many of the early church fathers died. They in the first two to 300 years of the Roman Empire, after Christianity had been established, many Christians died for their faith. And Ignatius wrote this as when he found out he was going to die. He said, now I begin to be a disciple of Christ. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let the breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil, let it all come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Jesus Christ. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, the call to follow Christ, when Christ bids a man to follow him, he bids him to come and die. But the call to follow Jesus is a call to die for every Christian, not just Peter. Peter's not the only one who's called to die on the cross, is he? Every one of us who claim to follow Jesus had been called to take up a cross, to die to sin, to die to self, to die to preferences, to die to your own desires. And so while Peter gets his own personal prophecy, I think all of us must consider the path of persecution. We must all consider, are you willing to pay the price to follow Jesus? One of my favorite preachers who's dead was Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, I've mentioned him several times in sermons. He was a revival preacher. He was British, but he, he preached one time and he said, the moment that a man was nailed to the cross, he lost all his rights. And if you ever get nailed to a cross, you'll lose all your rights too. Peter knew what it meant to go to a cross. You have no rights and Peter knew he had died to himself, and every one of us has to ask the question, are we willing to embrace persecution and suffering, and yes, even death, to follow Jesus? Peter knew the cost, and he willingly gave up his life for Christ because when he wrote the book of 2 Peter, do you know how he introduced himself? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he said, I am Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Christ Jesus. He doesn't start with his title as an apostle. His first introduction was, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. He put his servanthood before apostleship. He doesn't cling to any title because first and foremost, Peter considered himself to be a slave to Jesus. His title and his position did not abstain him from suffering and death. He lost all of his rights when he followed Jesus and he surrendered his life to Christ. And if you follow the Lord Jesus, you will lose your rights and your claims to your own way. You will be a servant to the Lord Jesus who holds your life in his hand. That's the cost of following Jesus. And I would ask you to consider it well. And if you count the cost and you consider it worth the price, then take up your cross and follow Jesus. And there's good news here. Peter knew this. In 1 Peter 4, verse 19, he said, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Your life is not in your hands, and you ought to thank God for it. Your, hand, your life is in God's hands, and he is good, and you can trust him. That's the cost. There's a cost to discipleship. There's also a call to discipleship. When Jesus tells Peter in verse 19, follow me, the tense, the verb tense is a present tense, meaning keep on following me. That is, don't just follow me once. Don't just follow me for a month. Don't just follow me for a year, but keep on following me, Peter. 
He's, it, it's a call to persevere, a call to endure to the end. Remember, Jesus had already told Peter three years before to follow him. You guys remember Matthew 4, verse 19? He tells Peter, drop your nets, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That call hasn't changed. Three years later, it's the same thing. Peter, follow me. I know I told you once, but I'm telling you again, keep following me. And and maybe you've been discouraged in your walk with the Lord Jesus. Maybe it's been tough for you lately. And maybe this morning the Lord wants you to hear, keep following me, which means we have to pursue perseverance. Now, how do you do that? How do you persevere in, in the midst of a world that that stands against you in a world where you're battling sin and you're battling temptation, when you're battling the grief of the loss of loved ones, when you're battling the the heartache of, of sickness and disease and the pain of suffering, how do you persevere? Well, the scripture tells us how all throughout the Bible. You first have to embrace endurance in the race that you're running. You fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You cultivate character through trials. Lanny spoke in our men's breakfast this morning from the book of James about counting it all joy when you fall into various trials because it is testing that produces perseverance. Or Romans 5, verse 3, rejoice in suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. How do you, how do you endure to the end? You keep serving. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Keep serving, because your work is not wasted. How do you endure to the end? You focus on the reward. Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Don't give up. How do you endure to the end? You trust God for his grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There's a call here to persevere, to to pursue perseverance, but there's another way that we endure to the end. We have to prioritize God's praise. Remember who you're living for. Remember why you're living. Look at verse 19. I'll I'll show this to you in the text. Verse 19. This Jesus said to Peter, how he was going to die, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Guys, the, the call to discipleship is to live a life from beginning to end that glorifies God. To live for God's praise. You are not living for yourself. And that ought to help you get to the finish line. Peter's death would glorify God. And when you die to your own desires, and when you submit to Christ, when you follow him, even in the midst of suffering, even when life is crumbling in on itself, even when everything's falling apart and you still follow Jesus, you show to the world that God is greatly valued, that he is worth losing everything for the sake of Christ. You show God to be great when you follow him, especially in trials. There's a a cost to discipleship. There's a call to persevere in discipleship. But this is also a command. Before we move to verse 20, I just want to point out this is a command. He tells Peter, follow me. That is, follow. Don't get ahead of me. You're not the leader, Peter. You're not in charge. I'm the shepherd. You're the sheep. Know your role. Know your position. Let me go ahead and lead you, and you follow me. Follow. But then he says, follow me. Don't follow a preacher. Don't follow a pastor. Don't follow a teacher. This was the problem in 1 Corinthians. Some said, I follow Peter, and I follow Apollos, or I follow Paul, or I follow Christ. 
There's no division in the body of Christ. We are all following Jesus. And, and I think this just keeps it so simple for us. It's a simple command. Follow me. That's all you got to be focused on. Follow me. It's not an option for the Christian. It's not an option for you to say, well, I, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. I believed in him as my Savior, but I haven't yet trusted in him as my Lord. By the way, there's a teaching out there that teaches that. They deny lordship salvation. They say, well, you can actually be a Christian and have Jesus as your Savior, but not have him as your Lord. We got a good word for that. Hogwash. You thought I was going to say heresy. It's heresy too, but it's hogwash, or the Greek word. And that's the word for it. There's, that's, that's not what it means to be a Christian. If you are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus. That's what the word means. So don't deceive yourself and think, I can, I can trust in Jesus and have all my sins forgiven, but then live however I want to. Friends, that will lead you to hell. Follow Jesus. So the point here, Jesus is saying, is follow me no matter what happens to you. No matter what happens to you. If you get sick, follow me. If you get a promotion at work, follow me. If you lose your job, follow me. If you get married, follow me. If you lose your spouse, follow me. If you're still single, follow me. If you get a bad result from the doctor, follow me. If you lose your health, follow me. If you lose your retirement, follow me. No matter what happens to you, Jesus is saying, follow me. And Peter thinks he's got it. But he doesn't. <laughs> Because there's a second thing we have to learn here, and it's not only follow Jesus no matter what happens to you. We gotta learn. We gotta follow Jesus no matter what happens to anybody else. Now, that's all we gotta do to get started. Just follow. That sounds simple, doesn't it? All we have to do is keep going through the valleys and the mountains we face. Just follow. All I have to do to finish is to follow. One step at a time. You get started by following. You get to the end by following. Oh, but Peter doesn't make it two steps. I mean, he's only gone a few steps. I mean, the Lord's walking down a beach. Peter, just follow the footprints, man. It's pretty simple. We're going in a new direction. Peter's been fully reconciled. He's been fully restored, reinstated for service. He's gone from fisher of men to tender of sheep. You know, his mind's spinning. He's processing all this. This seems a little scary. Right now, though, all I got to do is follow him. We're on a beach. Just follow the footprints. He takes two steps. And look at verse 20. Peter turned. I mean, we hadn't even got down the beach good, and he's already turned around. Peter turned. What did he turn to? By, by the way, verse 19, when Jesus says, follow me, I think in general he was saying, follow me your whole life, Peter. I think in some way he was just saying, hey, follow me. We're going down the beach. I got something else I need to tell you. But as he's following him down the beach, it says, Peter turned. And what makes him turn? He sees someone else. He sees John. In verse 20, it says he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper. You remember in John 13, the one Peter motioned to and said, hey, ask him who's going to betray him. That, that John. This just shows there's intimacy between John and Jesus. There's also intimacy here with Peter and John. I think there's camaraderie here. I think they love one another. Peter's kind of older brother to little brother John, and John's, John takes some digs sometimes. John wants everybody to know, I won that race to the tomb. I'm faster than Peter. 
He's always pointing out the things Peter does. And I think Peter loves John. But I think when Peter looks at John, notice what he asks him. In verse 21, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about him? I hear that at my house a lot. Someone else gets in trouble. They immediately look to the sibling. What about her? What about him? It's not fair. And I know we laugh about our kids doing that. Oh, but we do the same thing, don't we? Something goes wrong in our life. And we look at our neighbor down the street who seems to have it all together. And we say, Lord, what about them? Why am I going through this? How often do we lose our stride in following Jesus because we are focused on others? So what do we do with this? Let me, let me point out four truths we need to get our minds around here in following Jesus and not worrying about what happens to other people. Number one, and this is really important, you have to resist Relational comparisons. You, gotta, you cannot fall into the trap of comparing yourself to other people. That's what Peter's doing in verse 22. He's looking at John and he says, well, what about him? Now, I think partly he's caring for John. I think he's concerned about John. He's saying, well, if this horrible thing's gonna happen to me, what about my brother John? But I think deep down, and because of the way Jesus rebukes Peter, I think deep down he's not just caring for John, he's comparing with John. Comparison is the thief of joy because comparison robs contentment. Comparison fuels envy and jealousy and it creates unrealistic expectations we put on ourselves. Comparison limits your gratitude. It shifts the focus to what you lack rather than what you already have. Whether you stop counting your blessings and you, we, we do this in all kinds of things with people. We look at others, we compare our weight. We compare our wealth. We compare our work. There's all kinds of videos on YouTube where you can check and see how much money should you have, what should your net worth be by such and such an age, because we got to compare ourselves to everybody else and make sure we're in the right spot. We compare, we look at ever, other people's houses, or their hair, or their husbands. What, there's, well, you, you can compare yourself in all kinds of ways to look at things, and we're, we're just always comparing and here's the deal, comparing, it doesn't matter if you rate them up or down negatively or positively, it, you can compare either with smug pride or envious inferiority, it will always feel, make you feel less in the end. I heard this quote and I think it's right on. Comparison is simultaneously trying to fit in and stand out. You're trying to fit in and stand out at the same time. So what is the truth we need to hear here? First, Jesus will not judge us according to our superiority or our inferiority over anyone else. Remember the parable where Jesus gave the, the man, gave the talents, the different talents to different people to the stewards, and one man he gave five talents, and one man he gave three talents, and one he gave one talent. And the man with five talents, he, he went and multiplied it, invested it, and he doubled his money. The guy with three or two, he doubled his money. And the one with one talent buried it in the ground because he was afraid of his master. When the master looks at the man with five talents who doubled it, he says, well done. When he gets to the man with, say, three talents, he says, well done. 
He doesn't compare the man to the guy with five. He looks at the guy who had three and says, well done, you did well with what you had. And he looks at the guy with one and he doesn't say, hey, you didn't have as much as them, so it's okay. He says, you didn't do faithfully with what I gave you. He's judged by what he had, not by what he didn't have. He's not judged by what others did. He's judged by what he himself did with what he had been given. And so Jesus is not judging you based on the performance of other people. He's, he's going to judge your life based on what you did with what you've been given. So let me just encourage you today, several ways. First, do not be disheartened if someone else is more educated than you. Do not be discouraged if someone may preach better than you or have different spiritual gifts than you. Don't be dispirited if someone is more successful than you. Do not be depressed if someone knows scripture better than you. Don't be downcast if someone seems more spiritual than you. Don't be dejected if someone is more gifted than you. There are all kinds of ways you can look at people in the body of Christ and get really down on yourself because you say, well, I'm not where they are. And if you have that mentality, you'll never serve the Lord faithfully. If you're always looking at other people and what they have, you're, just, you're not gonna be effective as a follower of Jesus. No, Jesus will not judge us by how inferior or, or superior or inferior we are Jesus will judge us by how faithfully we follow him. There, there's a big push on social media, and it's been going on for years. And the question that people want to know is, how many people are following me? How many followers do I have? But meanwhile, the Lord of the universe wants to stop you in your tracks, look you in the eye, and say, what matters is not how many are following you, but how closely are you following me? You follow me. That's what Jesus says to Peter in verse 22. Jesus said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. God is never going to ask, why were you not more like him or her? God is not going to compare you with anyone else. He is molding you to be more like Jesus. And that happens when we follow him. So let me give you just a few more encouragements before we move on. First of all, do not look up at those above you to make you feel worse. Don't look up and say, boy, I wish I had what they had. You'll be miserable. On the flip side, do not look down on those below you to make you feel better because it won't. Might make you feel better for a minute, but it, it's empty. And here's the truth. If you compare with others, you will never be content. Contentment is such a big theme in the Bible. In fact, in Philippians, the verse that we usually always take out of context, Philippians 4, 19, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know what the context of Philippians 4 is? Contentment. Peter said, or uh, Paul says, I've learned to be content in all things, whether I have little or have much, whether, whether I have a lot or I have nothing. I've learned to be content in all things. In fact, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How do you learn to be content? In Christ. If you compare with others, you'll never be content. So instead of competing with others, just count your blessings. Count your blessings and follow Jesus. So this is the first idea that we see. Resist relational comparisons. Resist the urge to compare yourself to others. Number two, remain resolute in your calling. Remain resolved to follow Jesus no matter what. By the way, this is not the first time that Peter took his eyes off Jesus, is it? This was a nasty little habit Peter had. And it's not just Peter. I mean, we all have this habit of taking our eyes off Jesus and focusing on other things. Let me just remind you of other times in Luke chapter five, verse eight, when Jesus calms the storm, 
Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and he looks inward at himself and he only sees his sin. He doesn't see the mercy and grace and power of Christ. He only sees sin. In Matthew 14, in another storm, he he comes out of the boat and he starts to walk on the water, but he takes his eyes off Jesus in the storm and he starts to sink. When he gets his eyes off Jesus, And now he takes his eyes off Jesus on this beach to look at John, and he starts to stray. Peter turned. Don't turn. What did Jesus say about the kingdom of heaven? He said, it's like a man with a plow, plowing straight ahead. And when you plow, what does he say? Don't look. Don't look to the left or the right. Anyone who looks to the left or the right or anyone who looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Instead, focus on following Jesus rather than comparing yourself to others. Verse 22, it doesn't say it this way. When when Jesus says, Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. Can I put that in Calhoun terms? Peter, mind your own business. That's what he says. Mind your own business. What is that to you? Peter, if I want John to live a thousand years... Until I come back, what is that to you? It's none of your business, Peter. Charles Spurgeon said, this is good advice. He said, I have come to the conclusion that instead of trying to set all of the Lord's servants right at once, my first and most important work is to follow my Lord. And I think, my brothers, that it would be wise for you to come to the same conclusion. Don't worry about other people. You follow me. Paul said this in Philippians 3, 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, one thing, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know what I like? Simplicity. Keep it simple for me, Jesus. Just give me one thing to do. And Paul says, one thing I do. I I forget what's behind and I look forward to the call of God. Isn't that simple? That's that's an easy thing. Just focus on Jesus. Here's the truth. We all have the same commission from Jesus. In John 20, Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. He has sent all of us, but here's the catch. We are all sent, but we are not all sent in the same direction. God has different things for all of us to do. We're all running the same race, but we all have different lanes. We're all running for the same goal, but we each have different paths to take. Think about the body of Christ. When Paul says that the church is like a body, and you have a head, and you have ears, and eyes, and hands, and feet, and legs, they all have different jobs. And in the same way, God has given the church different jobs to do, and we're all good at different things. So we don't all have the same job, so there's no reason for the eye to compare itself to the ear or for the hand to compare itself to the feet. I think of Ephesians 2, verse 10. Paul says we're saved by grace through faith. It's not our own works so that no one may boast. But in verse 10, he says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And this ought to be encouraging for you. God gave me some things to do that he didn't give you to do. And he's given you some things to do that he didn't give me to do. And so you don't need to focus on what God told me to do. You need to focus on what God's told you to do. You've got people in your own life you can minister to that I can't. God has gifted you in in, so many different ways. Not everyone needs to be a preacher. Not enough room up here for everybody. We need some ears to listen. We also need people to serve. We have people who have all kinds of gifts in this church. Don't feel guilty if you're not a good teacher. Don't feel good if, I mean, don't feel bad if, you know, you may not like to sing or maybe you're not a good leader or, or maybe you've got some other gifts. Don't feel bad if if you've got something that you're good at that you like to do. God wired you that way. But whatever God's gifted you to do and commanded you to do, you need to do. 
Follow Jesus. There's different gifts, but the same Spirit. And, and even with Peter and John, Peter's going to serve Jesus by preaching and teaching, feeding the sheep, and by dying to glorify God. John is going to glorify God in a different way, by writing these things down and being a faithful witness so that people can believe what he's written and have life in his name. Now, I want to point out something really quick before we move on. In verse 23, we... This shows us how easy it is for people to twist the words of Jesus. In verse 23, John has to clarify something. Verse 23, so the saying spread among the, among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but he said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is important. There were people that thought, oh, Jesus said, John's not gonna die until Jesus comes back. Well, what would that have done to their faith when John died? They would have thought Jesus lied. And John has to be really careful that they don't twist the words of Jesus. Instead, John says in verse 24 that I am a trustworthy witness. I got to correct the rumor, but I want you to know everything I've written is true. And I could have written a whole lot more. That leads us to a third aspect of following Jesus. No matter what happens to anybody else, resist comparison. Remain resolved in your calling to follow Jesus. Focus on him. Number three, if you want to follow him, you need to recognize the richness of Christ. You need to see how great Jesus is and, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. Look at verse 25. I love this verse. And I think this is why John puts this here for us, so that we're not tempted to look at anyone else. He says, now there were also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that, could, that would be written. That's an amazing statement, is it not? As we close today and as we close the gospel of John, Brothers and sisters, let that verse sink into your hearts that after two years, after 90 plus sermons, John the disciple who walked with Jesus, who talked with him, who leaned on his chest at the Last Supper, he is telling us something profound. He's saying, after all I've written, after all the sermons, I've just given you a glimpse of Jesus, but there is so much more. Can you, can you get your mind around that? That if, if all of Christ's works were written down in books, the world could not contain the books that were written. The universe itself could not contain the fullness of his glory. Y'all, that is not just hyperbole. He's not just using a metaphor. He's not just stretching it. He, he is overwhelmed by the majesty of the Lord. So what does that mean for us? And this is just the part of, the, of preaching that moves from just teaching to worship. I mean, we ought to just put your pen down, Close your Bible and worship the Lord because we serve an inexhaustible Savior. No matter how long you've walked with him, there's always more to discover. You will never reach the end of his wisdom, the end of his love, the end of his power. I started thinking about this, going all the way through the Gospel of John. John is saying there is so much more about Jesus than we know, and we've already learned so much, have we not? I mean, in John 1, we learn he is the Word made flesh and the Lamb of God who takes away sin. In chapter 2, he is the temple that was destroyed and raised on the third day. In chapter 3, he's the Son of Man lifted up on a pole, and he is the great bridegroom of the bride of Christ. In chapter 4, he's the Savior of the world. In chapter 5, he is Lord of Sabbath, and he is the final judge of all the earth. In chapter 6, he's the bread of life. In chapter 7, he was the living water. In chapter 8, he is the light of the world. In chapter 9, he is the one who opens the eyes of the blind. In chapter 10, he's the good shepherd. In chapter 
chapter 11, he is the resurrection and the life. In chapter 12, he's the king of Israel. And yet in chapter 13, he is the humble servant who washes his disciples' feet. In John 14, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through him. In John 15, he is the vine, the true vine. In chapter 16, he is the one who has overcome the world. In chapter 17, he is the one who was sent to the world, and yet he is the great high priest who prays for his people. In chapter 18, he's the king of the Jews. In chapter 19, he's the final sacrifice for sin who said it is finished. In chapter 20, he is not dead, but he is the risen Lord Jesus who has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And in chapter 21, he is the one who calls us to follow him that we may have life and have it abundantly. And yet John gets to the end of the book and he says, guys, I'm running out of space. I'm running out of ink. I'm all out of paper, but there's still more. And the many other things that Jesus did includes what he did for the disciples after he was gone, the book of Acts in the church. And for 2,000 years, Jesus has not stopped working and all the books and all the libraries of the world could not contain it. We serve an inexhaustible savior. Oh, but I'm not done. We worship an indescribable savior. Y'all thought I was done, I'm not. No, no, there's more, there's more. All the dictionaries cannot define him. The encyclopedias cannot exhaust him. All the libraries cannot limit him. All the hymnals cannot hold him. The theologians can't fully fathom him. All the philosophers can't fully comprehend him. Artists can't fully capture him. Poets cannot fully express him. Historians cannot fully chronicle him. Scientists cannot fully explain him. All the scholars cannot fully analyze him and all eternity cannot fully reveal him. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man ascribed by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and his riches are unsearchable. His love is unfathomable, his grace immeasurable, and his glory incomparable. Hallelujah, there's nobody like Jesus. Recognize the richness of Christ. You'll never exhaust him. You'll never get to the bottom of that well. If you follow Jesus for a year, if you follow him for 70 years, you'll never get your mind fully around him. And that leads to the, the final call. Respond to the Redeemer's call. I mean, this is the last sermon in John. And for two years, I've pleaded with you. John has pleaded with you. Believe in him. Follow him. And now one more time, Jesus is saying, follow me. Follow me. Friends, this is an invitation to spend your life exploring the depths of Christ, to never become complacent thinking you figured him out, to approach each day, each scripture, every prayer with fresh eyes, knowing that there's always more for you to uncover. You don't have to look at others. Focus on Jesus and follow him. So how do we do this? Let me, I'll sum this up. Friends, fix your eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of your faith. Fix your eyes on him and not anyone else. And when you fix your eyes on him, then follow him and focus your energy on Jesus. Fix your eyes on him and focus your energy on Jesus. Serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength. And follow Jesus to the end. Follow him to the end. So let me, let me challenge you. I know we're closing the book on John, but don't close the book on Jesus. Keep reading, keep seeking, keep discovering, because the story of his work in this world and the story of his work in your life is far from over. Follow him, no matter what. Before I pray, um, I, I, I want to extend another invitation to you. If you've never followed the Lord Jesus, I, there's no better time than to do it today. Today is the day of salvation. 
And maybe you've listened, you might have been here from the beginning of this series, and you've listened to sermon after sermon after sermon about Jesus, and you still haven't followed him. When this service is over, I I would ask that you come and talk with me. But you don't have to talk with me to follow Jesus. Right where you sit in your seat, right now, you can call upon the name of the Lord. In your heart of hearts, trust in him, repent of your sin, and trust in the one who died for you, who was raised for you, and now calls you to follow him. And I'd love to speak with you after our service is over. Don't leave today without following Jesus. Because in the words of Peter, who else are you going to turn to? He's the only one who has words of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this beautiful gospel, the gospel of John that for two years has pointed us to focus on Jesus, to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Father, may we not leave today without following him, without giving him the worship and the adoration that he truly deserves. Father, I pray for the one in this room who may not follow Jesus, that you would draw them to Christ. And for those of us who do follow, Father, keep us from comparing ourselves to other people, Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And we know that you who began a good work in us will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. 